Good afternoon. This is Noha Khouri from uh, the Department of History of Art and Architecture at UCSB. And uh, I'm very happy to be uh, speaking to the friends of the Gorita Public Library. This is not the first time I have done that. And I want to thank uh, Corinne Horowitz for inviting me uh, to do so again. Uh, this is a very different uh, uh, format and technological platform than in the past. And I hope you will forgive my many foibles as um, I deal with the uh, distant um, uh, format that we have to deal with right now um, in terms of uh, Zoom technology. Um, to make this uh, more um, uh, proximate, I am going to try and speak most of the talk rather than read it so we get the sense that we are together. And I'm going to talk about uh, the uh, important painting called The Snake Charmer by Jean-Léon Jérôme for most of this uh, talk, but I want to make it an entrance into a discussion of uh, diversity and difference topics that are very important for us right now and that we are dealing with, but that were also very important in the late 19th century and from the initial moments of the onset of modernity as we know it, into the 20th century and until today. So this topic of diversity and difference is nothing new. It is something that uh, people had to grapple with in the past and that uh, we are still grappling with right now. And I will uh, discuss uh, this material, which I hope you will enjoy through um, the vehicle of Jean-Léon Jérôme in particular, even though he is uh, basically the poster boy for a whole movement of European art, Orientalism, and uh, he is not alone in the portrayals and representations uh, that we are going to look at, again, especially through the painting that is behind me, in fact, The Snake Charmer. So uh, I will talk in the first part and the longest part of this um, uh, discussion about uh, Jérôme and his strategies and uh, how these strategies actually were directed at representing a, a, a truth about the Ottoman Empire in a particular way. And the Ottoman Empire was a powerful political enemy at the beginning of the 19th century that lost its power towards uh, the end of that century. From uh, the discussion of Jerome, I will move to responses uh, by the Ottomans, formal and informal ones, to such Orientalist representations. And then at the very end, uh, I will uh, sort of come to a point where we question perhaps together uh, the Ottomans' own strategies at the end of the 19th century and uh, the way that they came to absorb some Orientalist strategies themselves and to apply them to their own people. So these are the three sections. This will be a very short section at the end and it uh, leads to a, a question. Uh, if you have any comments about the talk after it's over and in the days uh, uh, to come, please feel free uh, to write to me. My address, my email is at the beginning of this uh, presentation. And please, uh, if you would use the subject heading Jerome, then I will know that this is from you. So the Ottoman Empire uh, actually existed uh, from uh, 1453 onwards. The Ottomans were Turkic peoples who appeared at the very beginning of the 14th, uh, 14th century, but established an empire starting in 1453 with the conquest of the city of Constantinople, of the city of Constantinople that uh, we see over here at uh, the conjunction of Asia and Europe. And in time, they were expansionists. And in time, they took over uh, most of the main cities of the Arabian Peninsula, uh, Egypt, North Africa, uh, um, Tunisia, Algeria, with the exception of Morocco. And then uh, on the east, uh, the Eastern Mediterranean, Iraq, and going up into Eastern Europe, the Balkans, Dalmatia, and Greece at a certain time. So they were very expensive as an empire and they controlled a region between Western Europe and further Eastern lands that was strategically important 
and formed a uh, um, bulwark for any uh, Western European expansion at a certain time. So they were very powerful, very wealthy until uh, the 19th century when be they began to lose ground, uh, both technologically and in terms of uh, their economy. And eventually uh, they would lose most of their uh, provinces in Arabia and elsewhere to colonial power. So this moment is a moment when they are about to, to lose all of uh, these uh, provinces. And it is at this time that they begin to change their policies and views of their own people. And I am seen to be pitting this giant Goliath against a single man, Jean-Léon Jérôme, a small David, right? Uh, uh, Jean-Léon Jérôme, the French artist uh, who uh, uh, lived until the very beginning of the 20th century. We see him here in a photograph uh, by Nadar, who was um, a very well-known photographer. Uh, he is, uh, Jerome is a young man here and he actually lived a good, uh, long and fruitful life producing uh, hundreds of uh, paintings and working in different media. I am using him as a, an exemplar of Orientalist art for a number of reasons that I will explain, including the fact that he made uh, many trips to Istanbul and the regions of different regions of the Ottoman Empire, but also uh, because he was uh, um, uh, he became the poster child of Orientalism, not with me, but uh, earlier uh, when his painting, The Snake Charmer was used on the cover of Edward Said's uh, important uh, critical study, Orientalism, that was published in 1978. And it has gone through many, many republications and editions. The very early ones um, have a, a detail from the snake charmer that you see here in the first edition and the second edition on their cover. And it is a detail from this larger painting that focuses on the figure of the boy and their surroundings. Uh, Edward Said himself did not discuss the painting, but it was clearly a duplicate of some of the content that he discussed in which he uh, maintained that uh, Orientalist scholars, scholars who studied the Orient as a region, uh, had certain attitudes towards the or Orient that were biased. And also that through these attitudes, they formed an image uh, that did not conform to reality, even though they gave the impression that it conformed to reality. The Orient that they talked about was according to Edward Said, an imaginary place that existed only in their minds. And so the question then becomes in relation to the painting, to what extent can we work out how imaginary or not it is? Obviously, Edward Said was implying that this was an imaginary scene in an imaginary Orient that um, Jean-Léon Jérôme had dreamt up himself and that it had many implications uh, for the Ottomans and their regions and the people who lived in the Ottoman Empire, such as this group of people uh, who are portrayed in this painting. So to go back, uh, so that's one major reason uh, why I'm using Jean-Léon Jérôme and his uh, snake charmer to uh, discuss these transformations and discussions of diversity and difference in the 19th century. But also Jerome is a very good uh, artist to talk about because he did represent a uh, very important uh, modern trend and he did have a huge amount of influence on a large number of people. So for one thing, he was for a long time, the leader of many cultural institutions, including the Institut des Beaux-Arts in Paris, the Fine Arts Institute. He taught there and he also taught uh, in, um, independently, uh, presumably according to uh, various um, scholars, thousands of students. So he was a painter and he was a teacher of painting. He actually worked in different media. He sculpted uh, as well as painted and sometimes he painted his own sculptures, uh, both in paintings, but actually the sculptures themselves. So he, he 
I also played with the idea of the arts and how they interacted with each other. He was famous for his uh, oriental scenes that he created. They were very popular. And uh, there are reasons for that, again, I'm, that I'm going to go through uh, in detail. Um, and they formed about two thirds of his artistic output. So this was a large artistic output um, in which he represented this place, the Orient, uh, in a manner that was accepted and uh, talked about as documentary realism. So these are very realistic looking paintings that seem to document scenes that he saw uh, on his trips, many trips to Turkey and Egypt, and again, the regions of the Ottoman Empire. And through them, uh, Jean-Léon Jérôme came to be respected again as a documentarian and sometimes also as in, an ethnographer. So he could um, actually uh, categorize people and talk about them. So uh, his uh, place in um, the institutional framework of art in France in the uh, 1800s, his output and his popularity. Uh, as a teacher, which means he spread his ideas to many uh, art practitioners, but also his popularity as an artist. He was collected by many people and he wasn't uh, somebody who was, whose work was purchased only by uh, the rich and wealthy. He was somebody who rode the wave of modernity by uh, allowing his works to be reproduced mechanically. So uh, his, uh, um, uh, paintings could uh, be reproduced as prints and lithographs and then appear in books and also be sold as individual uh, prints to people who could not afford to buy the painting. Sometimes uh, some of them were reproduced in very small so uh, size on carte de visite, like business cards that people used. So he had a wide market base and part of uh, that uh, 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 success Mark was because he married into uh, the family, a family of publishers, the Goupil. Um, uh, they owned Goupil and company, and they were publishers who bought some of his paintings and then uh, with that bought the rights to them and reproduced them. And here I'm uh, showing uh, one of his uh, paintings that in the form of a print, a lithograph in fact, that was produced in a book during his own lifetime. So this was published in 1881 in a book called A Collection of the Works of J.L. Jerome in 100 Photogravures. And uh, the scene that we see here is one that I will return to. It is uh, of a group of people uh, whom he, uh, who are um, titled Bashi Bazooks uh, Dancing. Uh, again, this is a, uh, a reference to uh, people within the Ottoman Empire. The editor of the book uh, described and defined the Bashi Bazooks as a uh, lawless uh, bands of people who were recruited um, uh, into the Ottoman army as irregular. So they weren't really re recruited, but they were irregulars of the Ottoman uh, um, army who uh, uh, fought on the uh, borders and who were known for uh, being um, uh, very ferocious. So in fact, he uh, talks about them as uh, being uh, gathered from uh, out remote um, quarters of the empire and then having uh, scarcely any military training but being very savage. And he, uh, um, uh, Strahan, Edward Strahan actually says, uh, we can uh, learn more about them from uh, uh, these picture, uh, 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 he calls them picturesque pillagers. Uh, we can learn more about them from the British press in particular. But what we have here is Jean Léon Jérôme representing them in a singularly innocent moment uh, where they are dancing. And he continues to say in the East, men may change, but manners do not. And these dancers and chicken killers of Jerome's are the legitimate brothers of the soldiers of the Sultan. 
So on the one hand, we have Jerome painting these uh, picturesque uh, paintings of uh, people who are strange and different. On the other hand, we have uh, this description that goes along with these paintings when they are published in books and uh, sold to a wider base of consumers. And the descriptions go along with the painters' paintings in presenting a wild people, and then an idea about an East that does not change, that is timeless, that is ferocious, that is somewhat barbaric. And here we have uh, a, a group of people, they're called Bashi Bazooks, uh, as a, by the British, in fact, they are the ones who named these irregular troops Bashi Bazooks to indicate that they were part uh, an irregular part of the army. They did not have uh, army leadership like the rest of the troops and that uh, they were in fact uh, rather wild in their um, um, behavior. So uh, despite that difference, again, Strahan makes them the same as other Easterners who do not change and who are barbaric and the painting and with the description then spreads that idea to a larger group of people. So there was a kind of a preparedness to accept these ideas, but there was also a, a very great success on the part of Jean-Léon Jérôme to actually uh, disseminate uh, such ideas about the Ottomans. And the question is, to what extent were they true? To what extent does his documentary realism actually document what was going on in the Ottoman Empire at the time, and to what extent does it uh, reside in difference, racial difference, uh, to what extent does uh, Jerome actually contribute to the creation of difference at a time when that is very important. Again, in the conflict between the Ottoman Empire and European powers, who would later on take on uh, parts of the uh, provinces, the Ottoman provinces, and make them their colonies, such imagery uh, actually allows uh, the uh, colonial um, uh, incursion to occur because it carries with it the idea that we are going to go in and civilize people and change them and improve their lot, especially when these people are uh, uh, like the group that we see over here, on the left who are sitting against the wall doing nothing but watching this strange performance of a little boy and a snake. So this is the snake charmer and it is uh, the painting that I um, will explore more fully to uh, uh, understand better why uh, Edward Said chose it as the cover of his book, knowingly or unknowingly in terms of the basic details, but an, an analysis of the visual techniques of, uh, uh, that Jerome used actually uh, shows us again why he was uh, such an important Orientalist artist and how Orientalism works as a vehicle for colonialism. So uh, Jerome was again known as a, an important um, uh, uh, documentarian uh, for the great realism that we see in his paintings. I mean, the, the techniques the, uh, of presentation and rendition of forms of bodies of the many different skin colors that we see over here in this painting, the details, all of that was meant to contribute to the uh, documentary aspect of the painting. But it all begins when we first encounter the scene. As we uh, look at it for the first time, we realize that Jerome has chosen to present us with the scene uh, without any kind of a sense of um, heightened uh, drama. We feel as if we are walking down the street or he was walking down the street and he suddenly encounters this performance with its audience, the audience that is watching the performance of the snake charmer. There's nothing here that says that this is staged. It is a moment, it appears to be reportage more than anything else. Right? It is 
does not have the look of a composed or a staged scene, although of course we know that it was. But that aspect of it makes it seem real already. And beyond making it seem already, this particular moment that we happened to walk past or the artist happened to walk past and saw this scene, uh, beyond that, uh, this encounter that is accidental and coincidental uh, allows us to remain at a distance from this strange group of people. So there's a kind of difference, a uh, kind of distance that both constructs and maintains the difference between us and them, us and those others who are very strange. Again, they are idle. They are watching a very strange performance. Uh, we cannot identify with them and the artist doesn't want us to identify with them. He wants to create that differentiating barrier between us and them. And that is very important, especially in the 19th century, uh, again, with the ideal viewer being a white European male, we do not want to identify with this motley crew of uh, dark skinned people. I'm sorry, the uh, slides change. This motley crew of uh, mostly dark skinned people in different gradations. Actually, Jerome was praised, uh, this is where he is an ethnographer, was praised for his ability to um, uh, portray uh, different gradations in skin tone. So there's the kind of tension and obsession uh, with the color, with people's colors. And we have one white man in, in this uh, painting surrounded by darker uh, individuals. We have uh, presumably an Indian. This is a very interesting figure that has not been studied, but can uh, be, I think, fruitfully studied further. And then we have this uh, figure of the young boy, which is uh, very feminized as well. So, uh, we encounter this scene. It is a moment as we pass. Clearly, we are spectators, but we are not spectators of this strange performance. We are spectators who watch this strange audience that is watching this performance. And this is a strategy that appears in much Orientalist painting that uh, uh, presents Orientals as idle as exotic and strange as barbaric, right? And we see all of that in, uh, again, they're sitting there doing nothing, watching this young boy. Um, there is something, the, of course, the, the sexuality, uh, that the, the sexual tension here is also important to keep in mind because it says something about them as well. But this sense of uh, idleness and, um, just letting time pass by is also related in the surrounding space. So part of the documentary uh, value of Jerome is that he allows us to encounter these scene scenes as if we have just um, seen them accidentally. So he did not make anything up, but then his uh, portrayal of the context of the setting is also very important. When we look at this painting, we see his great attention to detail in the uh, representation of these beautiful tile panels with Arabic writing in cartouches uh, in each one of these arched panels, the, the representations of arches, and then in a very long uh, frieze of white writing on top of a blue background also above. And this is very similar to Ottoman epigraphic writing on buildings. Uh, there have been many, many arguments and fights about whether this is legible or not. In fact, Jerome was so good at copying uh, the writing and so careful and precise that some words can be read, uh, but as a whole, because he did not know the language and how it worked, as a whole, um, uh, it, can, it does not uh, actually, uh, it is not readable as a, um, an understandable text but it is very, very precise and very carefully rendered. And the same is true of the decorative panels uh, that we see over here. In fact, this is so true that we can identify them 
uh, all as coming from uh, a certain part of the Ottoman palace, an interior part of the Ottoman palace uh, called Topkapı Palace. And this is uh, one example. This is a different uh, toned uh, photograph because I wanted uh, it to go with the uh, tile panel that I have over here. Uh, we could uh, look at other uh, uh, comparisons, but I think this is sufficient to show us how uh, similar they are. And most of these panels that uh, Jérôme portrayed in this painting actually come from the private quarters of the Topkapi Palace where he could not have been. Uh, he probably worked from photographs and prints himself in order to represent uh, uh, this uh, wall, this context, which would not be something on a street, nor would this motley group of people be inside the palace. So already we begin to see hints uh, that this is a made up scene. And similarly, the, the floor that we see here that uh, makes us think we are in an interior, uh, it's hard to tell if this, this is an interior or an, or an exterior because of the strategies uh, that Jerome used of the interior uh, wall uh, uh, panels, tile panels used on interiors. And this floor that appears in another one of his own paintings and is associated with mosques in Cairo. So mosques uh, um, of late medieval and early modern mosques of the 15th and 16th centuries and a little bit earlier have floors of colored uh, stone and patterns such as the ones that we see over here. He reused it in this painting. And yet uh, this is uh, again, a very accurate portrayal of uh, places and spaces, but he is obviously assembling them in this painting of his. Again, for somebody who didn't know that, this looks very real because of the technical precision with which he has uh, produced them to the extent that he has also reproduced um, uh, these bricks, these damaged areas uh, of the tile. And again, if uh, we were to be uh, uh, presented as I am an artist who's painting a beautiful scene and composing this, then why would anybody include such damage, right? So again, this adds to his reputation as a documentarian. This is what he happened to see, and this is what he portrayed. It also adds to the negative understanding of the people who are in charge of these uh, buildings and beautiful tile panels because they are letting them go, uh, uh, letting them deteriorate. So there is a sense of lack of work, lack of industry, lack of care, uh, basically lack of governance that is imputed by this painting uh, onto the people in charge who would be the Ottomans, but also uh, um, represented again by the group of people that we see over here, huh, that we see in the painting um, again as idle and uh, simply fascinated by a strange um, and a somewhat scary performance in which uh, this boy has the snake wrapped around him. So the details that he includes the precision with which he includes them. And then his own uh, amazing technique, he was a, an absolutely wonderful painter where the textures of skin and hair, uh, the snake itself, the tile are so precisely and beautifully rendered and so smooth that we do not see his brush strokes. That is uh, again, a hallmark of Jean-Léon Jérôme's uh, work. We do not see his brush strokes. And as a result, the uh, painting as a whole takes on the appearance of a photograph, a new technology of the time um, and a technology that was believed to have a very high truth value. So between what he represented, the moment uh, uh, of uh, representation that, is, that seems to be an unplanned moment, and then the techniques and the attention to detail and the precision, uh, all of these uh, give us uh, a sense that this is not a, an image that is made, that the artist's hand is not part of the making of the scene, that this scene is real and existed and he did not make it up. But in fact, 
we can tell from uh, the fact that he broke the floor from uh, one uh, set of photographs or prints or even sketches that he made during his travels. And then the um, uh, tile panels from another set of sources in another place, uh, we can uh, immediately start to see that this is all made up. This is all imagined. This is an imaginary orient as um, Jerome saw it and as he represented it. So this is the snake charmer in 18, of 1879 or thereabouts. It is an undated work. We don't know exactly when he painted it. And that is actually uh, very interesting because there are many sources that could be used for this painting, uh, for dating it, that uh, might give uh, different possibilities. But uh, this is uh, the agreed upon date at this time. So. This painting, again, uh, was actually shipped to the United States shortly after it was made. Um, much of uh, Jerome's Orientalist um, production uh, was very popular in uh, this country uh, more than anywhere else, although um, a lot of it uh, was elsewhere as well, including, in fact, at the Ottoman court. He, they, the Ottoman uh, royal palace bought some of his paintings, but not the Orientalist scenes. So he was connected, but he makes us think that the world that we're seeing over here, one, uh, there is no industry or work, to there is no sense of time. It's all very timeless. This is how it has been in the past. This is how it will always be, uh, much as Strahan himself said. And then that there is no connection between us and them. And definitely there is no presence of a European uh, in uh, this Ottoman context, even though this was a time in fact of intense uh, Ottoman European engagement, which had been around before, but uh, was particularly important at this time. So to look at uh, Jerome, just to give one other example or two um, uh, of Jerome's sources, um, I'm showing here a painting, the painting on the far right, I'm afraid to touch my mouse because it seems to change the, um, the slide. The painting on the far right is called Working in Marble, and it actually shows Jean-Léon Jérôme in his own studio, finishing a sculpture. Uh, and we have his model uh, in front and the sculpture behind. And uh, he's showing us that he works in sculpture, but he, he's showing it in a painting, right? The point for this, uh, uh, that we want to take from this, is that in his studio, he's surrounded by all sorts of objects. Uh, we see masks, we see drums, we see uh, some uh, headgear, we see textiles, we see uh, something that looks like armor that he used in um, paintings of Roman scenes sometimes that he made. And uh, some of these appear in his paintings such as uh, the hat that we see over here. We see a gentleman uh, on, in this painting uh, called The Slave Market, also by Jerome, that is dressed uh, very much like these figures, very much like uh, these figures in, on the left, uh, who are uh, uh, meant to be uh, North Africans. Uh, and this is a detail from a um, print that was made of a celebration at the end of the Paris Colonial Exhibition of 1889. Uh, it's, a, it's a large print with a lot more uh, um, people in it, but this particular one shows us these figures and bonuses, which are quite similar to this one. So he seems quite anachronistic in the setting that we see over here um, of the interior of a, um, uh, what is called a uh, Khan in Cairo with different uh, figures that we see in, if we look uh, closely at these figures dressed in different ways. And um, Jerome likes to populate his scenes with figures who are often very different from one another. And the main action that is taking place is this uh, figure examining the naked woman 
uh, who is up for sale, basically. And, and so the content, uh, the subject matter indicates the barbarism of the people who are uh, portrayed. But if we look at uh, the details of the painting here, much as with the um, snake charmer, we begin to realize that Jerome is assembling um, his uh, scenes and making them seem real and documentary uh, by uh, using or painting uh, portraits of objects that he already had or using prints or using photographs that were available to him. His um, in-laws, in fact, were great collectors of textiles and objects from the East as well. So he had access uh, to those objects for uh, the staging of his paintings in his own studio that then he presented to the world in a way uh, and with techniques that made them appear to be documentary. And that is why he's a documentary realist according to uh, many art historians and remained that for a very long time until a critical art historical look uh, sort of deconstructed the way that he uh, created his paintings. But they are very alluring scenes of exotic and different and wild places in some instances. And they do compel us to look. They are very successful and attractive and they compel us to look and to consume these uh, scenes of strangeness while at the same time allowing us to stay removed from them, to be different from them. Uh, I do want to, uh, in passing, I want to draw attention to the model who is in his uh, painting, uh, working in marble that he used for the sculpture in the back of Tanagra, in fact. Um, uh, this model uh, seems to appear in a number of his paintings, and I think she is the same woman here. Uh, we do have her appearing more than once. I do want to uh, draw attention to that because the idea of models is very important. And I want to end with that later on as we get, uh, we get uh, to the end to think about who these people are uh, who are very, very different from the observers and where Jerome might have encountered some of these figures that he, that he uh, used to populate his paintings. So with all of these uh, techniques that he used, we have uh, Jerome uh, uh, producing these um, amazingly attractive and yet repulsive uh, for their content paintings. And uh, we have a, a, a respect for him as an artist with a great deal of uh, truth value, a realist. Uh, his veracity is based on technique and the rendition of authentic details, the faithful reproduction of objects, of textiles, of skin tones, and then those informal moments of encounter. Again, he doesn't create a kind of climatic moment. Suddenly we are uh, seeing this event uh, uh, as a major event, but he allows us to think that we are just passing through and we come across the scene and this is what life in the Orient is like, right? This is what life in the Orient is like. He's not making any comments on it. He is simply somebody who is an objective observer and he allows us to feel exactly the same way. And the, the world that he portrays is almost always um, outside of modernity, right? This idea of slavery, uh, the idea of uh, the way women are treated, idleness, um, not taking care of uh, the uh, context, the surroundings, the historical buildings, the structure of empire, the structures of life, social and material, all of that actually presented the East or the Orient as ready for European uh, tutelage, right, for takeover and improvement. And that is why Edward Said presented Orientalism as a vehicle for colonialism. So even though he did not talk about that particular painting itself, the uh, ideas within the book about thinkers, about scholars who are Orientalist scholars um, actually present uh, the same um, strategies in literature because uh, Edward Said was a literary critic. 
So given this, uh, of course, as I have said, uh, this was a, a time when uh, the Ottomans and Europe were engaged in a, a, a really an economic and political battle that was going to lead to World War I. And they were not unaware of what um, Jerome was doing. In fact, they bought some of his paintings um, and other artists. So they knew the portrayals of the Ottoman Empire outside. They read the reports and they were negotiating with European powers. Um, and they understood what uh, these paintings were doing. So they gradually began a series of uh, both um, what are called reforms within the Ottoman Empire, but also responses to this kind of representation of the Ottoman world, right? Uh, the Ottoman center and its uh, uh, provinces, which uh, reflected back on the center and the idea of Ottoman governance and was a kind of critique of the Ottomans. So uh, I'm going to quickly show some of these responses. Uh, the first one um, that I'm using as an example is a uh, photographic album that was uh, commissioned by the uh, Ottoman palace uh, and by the then governing uh, uh, ruling Sultan, Abdul Hamid II. So it is called the Abdul Hamid II album. It was produced uh, between the years 1880 and 93. And it was an album uh, whose many photographs uh, were of the institutions of the Ottoman state. So uh, we see here a number of buildings, a couple of interiors and an exterior uh, that reflected the Ottoman uh, uh, reorganization and modernization of their empire and the adoption of, in many cases, European technologies that were new. But if they thought that they were useful, they adopted them and they instituted them. So on the top right, we have an exterior view of a girl's school. So uh, that uh, actually is a kind of response to the representation of naked women being sold and bought in the markets of Istanbul and Cairo. Uh, in the bottom row on the right, we have an interior of a modern hospital. Uh, again, the most modern for uh, its time in the late 19th century. And at the very back, we can't actually see this and this image cannot be expanded very much. But at the very back of this view, there are actually two nurses, uh, you, there is one, we can just tell uh, the, about uh, the presence of one of them at the very uh, far end uh, of that ward. And that actually also speaks to the fact that women were entering the workforce, they were being educated, they were entering the workforce. On the bottom left, we have a scene from a textile factory. There are many photographs in this album that actually have uh, factories, uh, evidence of industry, new manufacture and technology. Uh, sometimes we have the new modern military school. Um, and all of these, again, were there to act as uh, evidence and representation in this new and modern medium of the photograph that did not lie according to the time uh, of uh, Ottoman modernity and progress. And this album was actually sent as a gift to the United States and it actually resides at the Library of Congress. So there was a, a message that was being sent through this to a, uh, um, another state, uh, in this case, the United States about the Ottomans and um, uh, their current state in the late 19th century. Another kind of response came from individuals. So um, uh, Osman Hamdi, whom I, I will talk about now, participated in two ways in responding to Orientalist thinking. One was informal, it was he was a painter and he painted scenes that seemed to talk back to Jerome, but he was also a statesman and his father was a very important statesman and he worked uh, for uh, the Ottoman government. Uh, as you can see here, he is a very handsome modern man. He studied and worked in France for 20 years and then after he went back home, he uh, uh, 
worked as a painter, but also he was the founder of the Academy of Fine Arts in Istanbul and of the Imperial Museum, which was the first modern museum of Istanbul, a, again, a borrowed institution, an adapted institution that goes back to 1891. And he was the first director of that museum. So uh, a poet, a statesman, a painter and archeologist, which is very important for, again, setting the history of a modern state. Uh, Osman Hamdi was a very talented individual who had worked with Jerome. And when he uh, went back home, uh, he painted in the style of Jerome. So he actually has that facility of technique, the precision, the looking at details that we see, for example, in this painting that is called the turtle charmer uh, for uh, reasons that are debated. Uh, we don't know exactly why. This was painted towards the end of his life in 1906. And it shows us his abilities as an academic realist. We don't quite understand the content, but we can see very clearly how uh, 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 much he perfected Jerome's uh, techniques uh, in um, academic painting and realism. However, he used them most of the time in a different way. So in the top row here, we see uh, three paintings. I've already shown you the one in the middle, the slave market by Jean-Lion Jerome. The one on the left is a pool in a harem and the one on the right is the Turkish bath. Again, from the 1860s and 1870s, painted by Jerome, presenting women in particular ways. And uh, of course demeaning and degrading to women, but through that, uh, they are meant to say something about the men, Ottoman men, be they Turkish or Arab or of any other ethnicity. On the bottom uh, row, we see uh, three paintings by Osman Hamdi. Uh, the one on the left is girl musicians. Then we have a woman reading the Quran. Then we have a woman having her hair dressed. In each case, again, using Jerome's techniques, of uh, academic realism, but presenting the women as educated, as having higher pursuits. They're not just sitting in a bath all day uh, smoking hookahs. They are uh, um, pious. And in the case of the woman on the far right, uh, which is a uh, kind of foil to the woman in the bath, where we have the black individual and the white individual, uh, and one takes care of the other who is submissive. This is, by the way, the same model, um, it seems. Uh, the uh, woman below, having her hair dressed, has a hairdresser who's just uh, apparently doing a job. We don't have anything there that is uh, meant to be uh, sexually exciting. They are just going uh, uh, about their business, right? So uh, Osman Hamdi created these scenes that were somewhat quaint because this is not necessarily how people were dressing and acting in uh, 19th century Istanbul. So he focused on tradition a lot, um, uh, but he did not create exotic scenes, strange scenes in the same way that Jerome did. So. Uh, something more human about uh, his depictions and his representations. Uh, and through that, he seems to be answering back the, uh, uh, answering Jerome's uh, representation of Ottoman society as being depraved um, and uh, focused on sensuality and not uh, 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 providing women with opportunities and instead uh, simply exploiting their bodies. So Osman Hamdi responds to all of that in a kind of uh, informal way because this is his uh, hobby as opposed to his profession. His profession, as I said, he was a statement and he uh, actually participated in many government uh, initiatives including uh, the initiative of producing an, a costume album that was undertaken again by the Ottoman government in 1873 in the context of the Vienna World Exhibition when the Ottomans wanted to showcase uh, variety in the uh, 
Ottoman domains within the unity of Ottoman governing structure. So this is a, a photograph of the Ottoman um, exhibition itself that shows us some of the objects that were displayed at this time. And uh, at the right of this photograph, we see uh, several mannequins uh, dressed in uh, particular costumes. There were people who also wore costumes who uh, acted as guides for the exhibition. Um, and uh, they were there to talk about the objects and about Ottoman life and to talk about um, Ottoman culture and history and also to, to sell some books that the uh, Ottoman government had commissioned and produced for this exhibition, including a book of costumes, a book of Ottoman costumes uh, that uh, uh, was displayed at this show. And this book is actually very interesting because it lies at this uh, transitional moment between a, a government that sees all its uh, subjects as part of a whole, um, an undifferentiated part of a whole, um, uh, all equal, and then gradually begins to shift to a government that does differentiate its people and begins to objectify them. And so another response to uh, uh, Orientalist portrayals uh, is an Ottoman government that is uh, presenting its own diversity of people through this costume book called the Elbise Osmanie. And then it has a French subtitle, the costumes of uh, Ottoman uh, regions. It is uh, a book that has 74 photographic plates, each of which has two or three figures posed in exactly the same uh, uh, space, actually against a blank wall in the house of Edhem Pasha, who was Osman Hamdi's father. Uh, and these two or three figures are always different uh, in terms of what they are wearing, but we do see repetitions of models. So, so clearly they brought in models and had them wear these different costumes in Istanbul, in the house, took the photographs, produced the book and sent it to uh, Vienna for the exhibition. In the very first plate, photographic plate of this book, uh, we have a, uh, photograph of three individuals, very different. Uh, and this is a strategy of the book. It groups different people together, sometimes from different places, sometimes of different uh, occupations, uh, but always within a kind of structure, an organizing structure of the book and the display and the way that the photograph is composed. So they are all subject to the authority of this classificatory system that is the book itself, right? And in this first plate, we see uh, one, the one example of a man who is dressed in exactly the way people dressed in Istanbul at the time in the 1870s, a bourgeois, uh, uh, outfit as opposed to what is called a traditional outfit. There's a, a text in French that explains these uh, images. Um, and this actually is a Stambouli frock coat based on a French frock coat and uh, the fez uh, that were uh, very much, uh, pretty much what people in the cities wore. It's also a costume that, or a, a set of garments <laughs> that the Ottoman government had tried to impose on everybody in uh, the context of a dress code that it tried to implement in uh, earlier in the century, in the late 1820s. Um, it, a dress code that actually failed. People did not agree all of them to wear it, but the idea at the time was that again, that would suppress difference and bring everybody uh, uh, more uh, into the orbit of uh, sameness and closeness to the centralizing uh, Ottoman government. Right? So that was a, a very authoritarian uh, uh, move. At the same time, it was based on this idea that as different as people are in our many provinces, they really are all equal. They all belong within the orbit of Ottomanness. Ottomanness. Uh, by the late 
uh, uh, years of the century in the 1870s, so between 1829 and 1870 ideas change. And the uh, LBC album reflects this change in ideas by showing us these figures from different parts of the empire, not always from cities, through their difference through their difference. So we have here the bourgeois individual, we have the traditionally dressed individual, and we have a domestic servant in between them. So he's giving, the first plate gives us a, a kind of variety of people whom we encounter, uh, might encounter in the city, but then the rest of the book, uh, uh, again, uh, adds variety to that. Uh, we have women, women of Istanbul, we have women of other regions uh, that uh, appear throughout the book. And for the most part, in the 75 plates that populate the book, the majority focus on uh, far regions, outlying regions, and on uh, different religions. So regions and religions. Already we begin to see that difference as opposed to sameness is what this book is actually uh, showing, displaying right, in uh, the idea of variety within a unity that is uh, the Ottoman uh, center, the Ottoman Empire, sort of like the United States um, uh, without the melting part, right? They haven't melted in, they're different. And uh, uh, the question is, you know, is that a good thing for them to melt in? Um, so we have here uh, examples of women from Istanbul. We have uh, these, uh, 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 Sufis, mystics, and religious uh, leaders, uh, not part of normative uh, praxis, but certainly a presence, a religious presence. We have Orthodox priests, we have Armenian priests who appear in the photographs. Here we have a mullah and a Bektashi and a Mevlevi, Sufi, uh, uh, mystical uh, uh, order members. And we have Bulgarians from uh, different regions. We have, in some cases, um, Arabs from different regions. So again, the idea of, of variety within this larger unity, but focusing really on region and religion, the ideas uh, of difference uh, from one place to the other, not necessarily in a bad way, except that everybody is subjected to this classificatory order and presented in a semi-ethnographic way for study, right? So they have presented these individuals through their costumes, but they have in a way objectified them and presented them to the gaze, to a scientific gaze in a scientific way as objects of study. Uh, at a time when they are about, in fact, to let go of them because the Ottoman Empire is eventually going to lose its provinces and it's going to be happy to get rid of them to some extent. So uh, the uh, a scholar who studied this album, Ahmed Ersoy, actually talks about the fact that there is an emphasis in this album on what he calls the wild things, the wild things, the people who are really outside normative practice, outside normative uh, social presence. And in this case, we see a Druze and two Christian mountain dwellers who would be from Lebanon today. Uh, in this other case, we see uh, these two individuals who are dressed in a very, have very interesting costumes with uh, very unusual to our eyes, headdresses and also compared to others uh, in the album and boots uh, and uh, weapons who are put side by side with an art artisan from the city of Aydin. Uh, these are uh, very uh, important for us because they are going to, uh, because they should remind us of some of uh, um, the paintings that Jerome created that I'm going to bring back. These Zaybaks were in fact among the uh, groups who were recruited as part of the irregular Ottoman army to defend the borders in times of problems. So they were exactly the people whom the British press named the Bashi Bozuk, the headless people, the people without leaders. Right? They were informal uh, uh, mercenaries, if we want, into the Ottoman army. They were also people who resisted the dress code reforms of 1928. So they were troublesome in more than one way. 
But for us, they're also interesting because they appear in, of course, Jerome's painting. So these are the ones that uh, are represented here as the Bashi Bozouk, which the editor of the book of photographers by Jerome uh, described in 1881 as uh, being uh, lawless, as being uh, uh, problematic, and as proof that in the East, men do not change. Uh, and the East itself does not change. And we uh, ask a question here, right? So we, we are at a moment when the Ottoman government itself is representing these peripheral people, these marginal people from different parts of the empire, subjecting them to a classificatory order, objectifying them. So it is absorbing some of the orientalizing strategies of a Jerome or another artist. But we also notice that, uh, and we want to notice that the people who are wearing these costumes here are people from the streets of Istanbul. They appear in more than one photograph. And similarly, the people who wear the costumes in Jerome's paintings are obviously not uh, people who were uh, uh, from Istanbul or from the regions that he uh, presumably visited where he saw these scenes because they appear more than once in his paintings as well. So the question is, where do they come from? I want to end with this question to say that Jerome, like uh, the Ottoman government that included these uh, figures in the uh, costume book, uh, also used models, we know that, and that his models appear more than once. So we see this uh, uh, black, gentleman over here who is a dancing Bashi Bozouk wearing a costume that is obviously modeled on something from a costume book or on a costume that Jerome had or had seen, but we see more than one and these are very similar. Um, and then we see the same uh, scenes um, figure in this beautiful painting of a, a portrait of a Bashi Bozouk. Uh, again, wearing uh, this uh, beautiful satiny jacket, the same jacket that we see here in the uh, photographer in the book, and the same headdress. And the question here becomes, uh, who is this individual? Who is this individual? Is he, in fact, uh, somebody from the Ottoman Empire, perhaps from North Africa, perhaps from other regions, uh, that Jerome encountered? Is he uh, somebody who um, was at the World Fairs where that Jerome attended and where uh, the Ottoman Empire also displayed its goods, its costumes, and obviously its people through photographs and through presence? Or was he somebody who was in Paris? Was he a Frenchman whose difference was subjugated and reflected onto another place and thereby basically was part of a diversity that was not acknowledged in France in the 19th century. So this is where I want to end. I want to end with this question about diversity and difference that are visible and invisible and how they can be dealt with differently and seen differently in different places and times. I hope you enjoyed the talk. Thank you very much for uh, joining.